our next speaker our prof dr amani azat ayad yes our the best lady today <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Ayman. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Muhammad, for the great organization for this event. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be among those uh, colleagues. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like uh, to take the opportunity to uh, greet Dr. Saad and the platform Mega Online. I believe it's one of the most visited nowadays by anesthesiologists from all over the world. So you're doing a great job. Thank you very much. And thank you for hosting our activity today. So um, my topic to you today is about uh, ketamine. Uh, they use uh, uh, updated guidelines for uh, acute and chronic pain. Um, before we start, I'd love to share a story with you um, in uh, 2017, we, uh, we were hosting in Cairo a great event, uh, anesthesiologists from all over the world. And uh, in that event, there was a speaker, a lady, uh, a big shot from the WHO. And uh, she started her speech with uh, that they are having uh, lots of projects. Among them, one is very important to them uh, um, that they want to ban uh, a drug called ketamine. And her uh, excuse then was that uh, substance abuse uh, utilizing the ketamine is surging in so many countries in Mexico, in India, in China, uh, even the lay people, they call it the uh, KitKat or vitamin K or whatever. And uh, also because there was no strong evidence and guidelines to support its utilization. Oh my God, that was arousing. Why is that? Because ketamine has been in the market for the last 50 years, maybe. And it was used a lot in the late 20 years as infusion to stop or to minimize acute and chronic pain. So uh, what is the idea of not having uh, uh, adequate evidence? So anesthesiologists from all over the world started to dig in the literature to find out. And I, I've done that as well. A um, few months later, I came across this uh, newsletter by the ASRA that was uh, entitled Intravenous Ketamine Guidelines for Pain Management by two eminent colleagues from Johns Hopkins School. And they were stating the same idea that despite the drug has been uh, in the market in the last at least five decades, we don't have decent guidelines. And they shared the idea that there was an ongoing uh, work um, that was supported by the ASRA in, co in combination with the American Academy of Pain Medicine and the American Society of Anesthesiologists. It was a combined work. Um, still the question that is raised, why didn't we have decent literature supporting the utilization of ketamine until now? Um, I think I have a, a personal humble uh, point of view that uh, ketamine has been produced in a generic formula all over the world and it's available in, at very cheap price and this is not tempting for the big you know pharmaceutical company to uh, spend thousands in order to support a drug that is already on the floor and it's available in generic cheap all over the world maybe that's the, the, the reason in uh, Anesthesia and Analgesia Journal that were in July 2019, there was a, another decent systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled uh, trials about ketamine infusion for chronic pain. And uh, um, in this very interesting uh, meta-analysis, they stated that they collected like uh, nine, close to 700 articles about ketamine. From them, and among them, only seven that met the criteria of inclusion that they stated because of the suspicion of bias, because of the market variability in every, in every aspect as regards the indications, as regards the, the formulation, as regards the dose of infusion. So uh, you cannot compare, you know, banana to oranges. You cannot do that. 
So uh, after checking close to 700 uh, articles, only seven were included. And this is a shocking statement, actually. A few days ago, there was another um, uh, article just released ketamine for the treatment of chronic pain, a comprehensive review. So finally, after digging in the literature, I found only maybe three or four or hardly five very decent articles to show and demonstrate. However, for any guidelines, I imagine that it should uh, respond to these questions. First, what are the indications? What are the contraindications? What is the pre-procedure testing for the infusion? What kinds of monitoring do you need while infusing the ketamine? What are the dosage guidelines? We need to define what is the positive end result of this treatment or the positive response. Is it complete pain? Pre uh, patient, is it 50% uh, reduction? Is it 30% reduction of pain? We have to delineate an endpoint. How can we prevent and treat the adverse effects and the value of repeated infusion? So, back to our uh, drug today ketamine is an NMDA receptor ion channel complex um, um, inhibitor. And the ketamine is a phencyclidine derivative that acts primarily as a non-competitive antagonist on this NM and NMDA receptors. Although it also binds to so many receptors all over the body. Um, among this, ketamine is postulated to be involved in signaling at more than 10 distinct receptor pathway. And by the way, the more it has places to work on, the more will be the profile of the side effects. So primarily ketamine exhibits its analgesic and the antidepressant and cognitive effect via uh, NMZA receptors inhibition. However, ketamine is, was found to work on the opioid receptors, the GABA or the gamma amino butyric acid receptors, the dopaminergic receptors, the nicotinic, the muscarinic, the cholinergic, and the legend of the serotonin as well. So it's a wide diversity of places that uh, ketamine works on. As regards the pharmacokinetics from our old anesthesia book, it has a very rapid onset of action, relatively a short and relatively a short duration of action. It has a very high lipid solubility. So very fast, it crosses the blood brain barrier. So it can work after one minute of IV administration and about five minutes from IM uh, injection. Initially, ketamine is distributed to highly perfused tissues such as the brain and the extreme lip because of its extreme lipid solubility and the ketamine is having a very high hepatic clearance rate. What about its metabolism? It's, a, it's metabolized in the liver uh, and it has only partially active uh, metabolite, which is norketamine. That is only one third efficiency from the parent drug and the, um, it is uh, excreted in the bile and the kidney. So, how can it exert its anti nociceptive or analgesic effect? Ketamine per se produces its anti nociceptive action via inhibition of the NMDA receptors. Uh, so it, and also it activates the descending inhibitory pathway. The NMDA receptors are part of the bad part of the pain pathway, while the descending inhibitory is a good guy. So it inhibits the bad part and it potentiates the good part in the uh, pain pathway. That's why it exerts a good effect um, uh, on the pain, in the pain pathway. Also, uh, NMDA receptors uh, mediated spinal reflexes are initially uh, responsible for what we call a, a pr procedure of wind-up or phenomena of wind-up. And this is incriminated as part of the uh, progression to chronic pain. And uh, that's, uh, this is how uh, it works. Sorry. Let's have a deeper look. What uh, do we know about the NMDA receptors? NMDA receptors or NAMDA receptors, they are available only on neurons. It's not available in, in, in any other tissues. So it's available only in the CNS and to a lesser extent on the peripheral nervous uh, system. The NMDA receptors are activated by uh, 
binding to two places together. And this is a unique process or a unique character of the NMDA receptors. Agglutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter known in mammals and humans, and also glycine. Both should combine, bind to its places in order to expel a magnesium from a, that works like a plug and then sodium and calcium uh, influx happens. So um, again, we know that uh, these channels are activated by excitatory neurotransmitters and they are part of the excitatory pain pathway. So ketamine is an MDA receptor antagonist. Do we have an evidence on that? Yes. And by the way, check this because this is level one evidence. I think this is the only time that I'm going to describe a level one evidence from any uh, review articles during this lecture. Uh, it was found that low dose ketamine infusion exerts an anti hyperalgesic effect, anti allodynic effect, and anti tolerance agent. Uh, hyperalgesia, it means that it, there will be an exaggerated response to normal noxious stimuli. And the allodynia is having pain from non-noxious stimulus like touch, like temperature changes. And the tolerance, it means uh, that over the time, you need to increase, to keep increasing the dose of your drug in order to exert the same effect. So there was a good evidence that low dose infusion of ketamine can exert uh, the three actions, and this is level one Cochrane review. Lodus parenteral ketamine also was found to uh, have a long-term uh, analgesia and a short-term analgesia that was reflected on opioid intake uh, for patients after uh, surgery. Uh, it was found also um, that administration of ketamine uh, will improve the pain outcome and decrease the need for opioids. Um, ketamine op potentiates the opioid uh, analgesic. Um, uh, there are two uh, articles with a moderate level of, uh, uh, of, um, uh, of evidence uh, that confirms that post-operative pain was much better uh, while infusing the patient with uh, low-dose ketamine, and also the opioid consumption was less, and also the post-operative desaturation was much less noticed in patients on ketamine infusion. And this is vice versa. We should understand that uh, when you uh, lower the dose of the opioids, of course, the uh, incidence of desaturation will be much less. What about the chronic pain? It was found in palliative care patients to reduce the pain and the opioid consumption uh, in one article by 50%. Uh, but this is a moderate evidence level. What about the interaction of ketamine with opioid receptors? Here I have to be honest that the uh, literature is very confused and confusing about the effect of ketamine on the opioid receptors. It was found that subanesthetic doses of ketamine exert a potent analgesia via uh, not only the NMDA receptor blocking only, but by uh, uh, wo uh, working as agonists on the mu, kappa, and delta receptors. And to our surprise that if you increase the dose and go to an anesthetic dose, the, it will be working like antagonist on the mu and kappa. And this is very confusing. And also it, it indicates that you don't need to give a big dose uh, infusion of ketamine in order to exert a good analgesic effect. What about the mechanism to prevent acute uh, uh, opioid tolerance? There is a phenomenon called acute opioid tolerance that it was found if you use strong opioid for quite long term, or if you use a high dose uh, opioid uh, in a surgical patient or a trauma patient. Um, the phenomena is not well understood, however, uh, Research suggests that there will be a receptor desensitization and receptor down regulation. What do we mean by down regulation? There will be less receptors available, active in order the drug can combine and exert its effect. And what does it mean? It means that you keep increasing the drug, the opioid, I mean the opioid drug, and there is no receptors to work on or, or even to combine. 
In such a condition, this is what we call acute tolerance. Uh, one of the scenarios that might, you might uh, have uh, um, seen maybe in your practice that a patient from RTA or a patient from major surgery or is on uh, PCA and the, all of a sudden it keeps escalating the doses and the daily consumption of morphine, for example, uh, one day, the second day is more than third day. This means what? It means that when you shower the receptors with a big dose of opioids, the process of uh, acute tolerance happens. And the NMDA receptors were found to be incriminated partially in this uh, phenomena. And uh, of course, if you give an NMDA receptor antagonism, of course, you, you will have this um, resistance to this uh, phenomena of opioid acute tolerance. And uh, in such a condition, the norketamine which is partially active metabolite of ketamine will continue the same cycle to uh, minimize or to lessen the uh, phenomena of acute tolerance. Ketamine also was found to have an anti-inflammatory effect. And this is, was very interesting, uh, actually, uh, uh, information. Uh, in vivo, uh, in animal uh, model or septic rat model in particular, it was found that infusion of ketamine uh, caused a decrease in the interleukin-6 and the uh, tumor necrotizing factor, which means it is uh, an anti-inflammatory drug. Also, uh, it was found again in another animal uh, liver injury model to exert a similar effect. What about the human studies? Uh, we came across one uh, research about uh, checking uh, the uh, inflammatory markers after cardiopulmonary bypass. And it was found that low dose of ketamine, 0.5 milligram per kg, attenuated to a large extent the uh, serum C reactive protein, the interleukin-6 after cardiopulmonary bypass. So it's very promising, actually. Uh, what about the ketamine uh, adverse effects? It increases, I think you have learned that long ago. Um, it increases the intracranial pressure. It causes sympathetic nervous system stimulation, causing increased um, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, and pulmonary hypertension, nystagmus and tremors. And here I want to stop at the nystagmus. By the way, nystagmus commonly, when you start ketamine infusion, it doesn't happen early. Commonly, it happens a little bit late. And by the way, it's one of the most scary side effects to the patient and his um, relatives if they are around. And uh, I think um, lately I started to warn the patient and his relatives that this might happen. And if it happens, they have to notify us. But uh, just to tell them that it might happen because nystagmus looks to them like that the patient is having a CNS injury or something. So you have to reassure the patient and tell them in advance that something might happen like this. Other CNS effects, including hallucination, uh, confusion, delirium, uh, bad dreams, and the irrit uh, irritable uh, behavior uh, is also a side effect. Again, and back to the same article about the guidelines of intravenous ketamine in acute pain. Uh, which patients and acu what acute pain conditions should we uh, consider uh, ketamine treatment for it? Uh, the overall sub anesthetic dose of ketamine infusion was used for post-surgical pain, and this is a level two or grade two evidence. It may be considered for opioid depending and tolerant patient post-surgery, but here the evidence is a little bit uh, uh, less, and the, there was an evidence um, about case reports and, uh, you know, uh, just a series of uh, patients uh, using um, um, ketamine infusion to resist this acute opioid tolerance after sickle cell anemia uh, attacks. And uh, this is a level C evidence. If we get back to the same uh, review and uh, guidelines, you will find that the indications for the use, the perioperative use uh, in surgery with moderate to severe postoperative pain, it's a grade two uh, moderate certainty uh, the perioperative uh, use in patients with opioid tolerance, level C, even less evidence, and the analgesic adjuvant to opioid to uh, minimize the tolerance, 
it was also grade uh, C uh, level of uh, evidence. What about uh, the dose consideration? Which dose should we infuse? As I was mentioning before that um, there is no agreement on certain protocol or no, almost no agreement on certain protocol for uh, subanesthetic infusions. But there is, uh, you know, a, a common uh, practice somewhere in some centers. A convincing evidence is lacking to support which subanesthetic dose to be used uh, as IV ketamine. However, moderate evidence supports that there we can use a loading dose of 0.35 milligram per kg uh, and a, a maintenance dose not exceeding one milligram per kg per hour. Uh, and also there is an agreement if we're going to use such one milligram per kg, not for longer than two hours. Uh, the higher the dose, the more frequent you will elicit CNS side effects. So you have to balance between the, your target and the side effects uh, that the patient will encounter. What are the contraindications for ketamine infusion? According to uh, the evidence, we, uh, we found that uh, patients with severe cardiovascular disease and poorly controlled hypertension are uh, contraindicated. This is a level uh, C evidence. Central nervous system in the form of uh, elevated intracranial pressure, another uh, level C uh, evidence, but it is contraindication. Elevated, of course, intraocular pressure, uh, marked hepatic dysfunction, and of course, psychosis and pregnancy. Uh, in such conditions, you should never use the ketamine infusion. Um, testing prior infusion. Do we need to do any special test in order to initiate the ketamine infusion? Actually, in normal, healthy individuals, you don't need any testing. But with individuals with suspected high risk for cardiovascular disease, a baseline ECG is needed uh, to rule, at least rule out an ongoing ischemic heart disease. Individuals with marked liver dysfunction needs, uh, will need uh, baseline liver uh, function and after uh, finishing the infusion, another one. Monitoring during IV ketamine infusion is a point of argument wherever you go. Uh, do we need to put the patient in ICU or a high dependency unit? What level of monitoring do we need for IV ketamine infusion? The literature is a little bit confusing, but um, most of the papers agreed on something. If you're going to give a bolus more than 0.35 milligram per kg, or if you're going to give an infusion over one hour more than one milligram per kg, you need full monitoring. I mean, ECG, oximeter, blood pressure. And who is authorized to monitor the patient? This is another question. Um, basically, a person who is familiar to utilize ketamine, uh, a well-trained on ACLS or advanced life support, and equipped for that. To conclude, anesthesiologist, critical care physician, emergency doctor, and pain management physician are the only one who are authorized to do the ketamine infusion. And what about the monitoring setting? As we told you, uh, uh, if you're going to use such high doses or relatively higher doses, you cannot leave the patient in the ward. You need him in the high dependency unit, or at least there should be a monitor. Is there any evidence supporting non-parenteral ketamine for acute pain management? Very scanty, very scanty uh, reviews about uh, nasal ketamine. So uh, we cannot uh, value that. What about the use of ketamine for chronic pain? I mean, the sub dose infusion. For chronic pain, the evidence suggests that higher doses can be administered over longer time of use. And the more frequent doses is scheduled. And uh, here, the, uh, the literature is very confusing. Either you bring the patient on daily basis or uh, you bring the patient for infusion on weekly basis. Some references uh, adapted the first policy and others adapted the other policy. What about the dose of infusion? The infusion rate was ranging from 0.5 milligram per kg um, up to two milligram per kg. The average was like one milligram per kg per hour over two hours. 
So as you're going to submit two milligram per kg, but over two hours. Uh, and of course, if you're going to uh, supplement such a dose, you need a monitoring. Yeah, for what indications can we use this subanesthetic dose? Uh, complex regional pain syndrome may be the only indication that showed a little bit a more solid evidence, but it is level C evidence. Fibromyalgia, chronic neuropathic pain, post pain, cancer pain, and phantom limb pain are among the, in the indications that is having some references, but not very solid reference. What about the other unanswered uh, questions? Whether ketamine can prevent the transition from acute to chronic pain? Can we answer that? Until now, the literature is, is not clear. If significant tachyphylaxis occurs, reducing the benefit with repeated administration. For example, if we uh, assume that there is a patient resistant to uh, treatment in chronic pain, so you decide, to uh, bring the patient on daily basis or on weekly basis to give him uh, a two hourly uh, uh, infusion. How frequent you can bring the patient? The literature is not clear, but on the average from four to six, seven times, but no more than this, because there is a question of tachyphylaxis uh, after this repeated infusion. So, so there is no need to uh, expand the, uh, the amount of repeated infusions. Uh, how can we identify which patients in particular uh, will respond and which patients will not respond? Actually, uh, we don't know. However, as, by, as per Carl Sagan, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So if we don't have evidence until now, it doesn't mean that the effect is not there. But actually, it means that we need more researches in order to have more solid ideas. That looks good, but how can I use it? I'll give you two scenarios uh, on my personal experience, my humble experience, and this is away from the literature, but based on the literature. For acute pain, a common scenario, a patient coming from RTA with frequent multiple fractures, and commonly we put the patient on PCA uh, morphine, for example. And the first day you find the patient, the nurse is telling you that the consumption over the 24 hours is like 30, 40 milligrams of morphine. The next day is like 50, 60. And after that, the patient is screaming of pain and nothing is helping. This is a scenario of impending acute tolerance. This patient in particular, I would consider uh, to initiate a ketamine infusion. Another indication from uh, chronic pain, a palliative care patient, uh, um, um, a resistant CRPS case and the patient on opioids and suddenly uh, he's not having adequate response. So you do rotation of opioids, you change the opioid, still the patient is like uh, the same. Uh, you give a maximal dose of adjuvant uh, anticonvulsant, pregabalin, gabapentin, uh, tricyclic antidepressants and still the patient is suffering. Commonly I give him a trial of uh, ketamine infusion. And uh, if he started to respond on, uh, on two times or something, infusion, I keep repeating for maybe four or five times, but no more than that. This is the two scenarios in which I, uh, I would adapt the ketamine subanesthetic dose infusion. Uh, what about the doses? I have adapted a protocol from Cleveland Clinic and I believe it's very uh, reasonable one. Uh, it's the dose is like without any boluses, two milligram per kg over 24 hours with uh, associated with um, uh, midazolam infusion. And uh, I, I've done this several times and every time actually I find a reasonable response without much hazards. So to conclude, despite its drawbacks, ketamine remains a very good drug at affordable price and it's universally available. We believe that its utilization will expand as more institutions try to, to use it more and more. A more robust studies are still needed in order to refine our selection criteria, ideal dosing and the uh, indications for uh, the infusion, a better understanding for long-term risks of ketamine in patients who receive serial treatments of uh, 
uh, due to acute pain exacerbations is still needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amani. This is a nice talk to show us that us our old trend drug and now in new indications. Uh, we have uh, about uh, three or four uh, case reports with uh, very resistant neuropathic vein in ICU, not responding to any opioids and high dose opioids and anticonvulsant drugs. And the solution was ketamine in low dose and a very good response. Uh, this is a, a very important in ICU uh, patients. And now we, uh, it must be part of our uh, practice in OR. All patients with hypotension, bleeding patients, all those, the best induction is ketamine. All induction agent will uh, aggravate the condition of hypotension, but ketamine may help to control the blood pressure not to go down. Thank you, Dr. Amen. I cannot agree more. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> Uh, may I, can I have a comment? Yes, please. Okay. What about ketamine? I, I myself use ketamine as a part of multimodal analgesia in, in many surgeries, not in, only in laparoscopy, in other surgeries. And it was very useful in reducing the opioid requirements post operative. Yes. Uh, well, literature uh, had many studies on this, uh, on this practice, ketamine, as part of multimodal analgesia. Uh, also, I, I used it, I, I, they um, asked me to give some psychotic patients uh, sessions of ketamine infusions repeated every three days for three weeks, three to four weeks for psychosis, especially the bipolar patients. And the depression as well. And the post and the manic depressive and the depressive yeah. patients. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And thank you, Dr. Amini. It's, uh, Dr. Walid. Dr. Walid. The vitamin alone is a multimodal analgesia because it acts on, on, on many receptors. Oh, but, but still it doesn't act uh, like the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and the, the paracetamol. Uh, we, we cannot, we cannot remove this from the practice. Ketamine okay. has anti-inflammatory effect, has opioid uh, receptors uh, stimulation, has yeah. an okay, stimulation. I may add uh, I may add uh, to, uh, to the speech of Dr. Walid that it's, it's never been used alone. I mean, it's an adjuvant for the uh, multimodal analgesia. It's part of this, uh, the whole scenario, but it will never be used alone because of uh, the more you use it uh, in big doses, you'll have psychological and uh, psychiatric, uh, and the, you know, neurologic uh, side effects. So you cannot use it alone. And those Can I add a comment? Yes. Yes, sure. Dr. Abraouf. Uh, yes, uh, I, I commonly use, for, if I'm going to give general anesthesia nowadays, I give uh, one cc ketamine 50 milligrams plus one gram magnesium in combination during induction because magnesium is another lambda receptor block. For post op or for chronic pain, continuous infusion, I use lower dose than, than being used in Cleveland, uh, nearly third of the dose of Cleveland combined with magnesium again with good results. And something new now, the making inhalational ketamine yeah. for, uh, for uh, psychiatric patients. It's new formula done for psychiatric patients. Uh, and the first line of treatment of depression now is ketamine. That's yeah. absolutely correct. Ah, it's already in, in the U.S. Uh, they have the inhalers of ketamine yes. for the psychotic patients. Yes, I know. Yeah, this. yeah. Okay. Uh, we, I would like to add only one, one comment, one word. We are using it routinely in uh, interoperative, especially robotic and uh, laparoscopic, as a part of ERAS, yeah. ERAS technique. That's okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Yeah, there is, I think there is loads of questions, if you don't mind, uh, you allow me to um, uh, to have some here. Is there any experience in S-ketamine, uh, Isomer? Uh, me personally, I don't have experience, but uh, uh, part of the literature was mentioning uh, the difference, and this was 
uh, a reason why we didn't accept most of the uh, you know researches to have a proper guideline because part of it is S, part of it is R, part of it is combined with magnesium infusion. So if you want to have a guidelines, you have to, to have it strict for only one drug and purely one drug. Uh, one more. I don't have uh, experience. Okay. No. One more question from the chat, from the question box. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Amani, for your nice presentation. Is there any supportive study or evidence for epidural ketamine, and uh, what is the recommendation dose? Um, there was, but actually, what uh, the formula we have here uh, is not uh, without a preservative. So. Um, Actually, on, on a clinical ground, I have no experience in that, but I came across there was, but I cannot recall the doses, actually. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Asketamine is contraindicated in severe hepatic disease. Can we use it in patient with a child A and B? No. Uh, uh, it was a relative uh, from, uh, if you remember the, the guidelines that I showed you, the evidence, it was a relative contraindication, not a complete, not a solid contraindication, but they named it a relative contraindication. Uh, I, I think I, we, we should thank you very much for this um, excellent, uh, uh, fascinating presentation. And I will pass to uh, Professor Mayer Fauzi for the time being, because we are running behind the time and we would like to make everything very, very punctual and uh, not to miss any 